I am joined by Mike Singleton of Invictus Research. Mike, welcome to Forward Guidance. How are you doing? Doing great, Jack. Thank you for having me. I love the show. Oh, appreciate that. My pleasure. How about you start, tell us a little bit about your background and your process for analyzing macro. How do you think about markets and the economy? Sure. So I actually began my career at a private investment firm called Broad Run Investment Management. Broad Run was much more bottom up in nature. So a lot of my early experience on the job was analyzing individual businesses, uh, evaluating their competitive advantage, their management teams, et cetera, et cetera. It was a terrific job. I really enjoyed it. The three managing partners and portfolio managers were some of the best business analysts that I've met in the business. That said, uh, I did learn after a certain amount of time on the job that bottom-up fundamentals don't drive all the price action for individual stocks. In fact, in a lot of cases, they don't even drive the majority. Um, So that led me to ask, what does? And uh, during my time in the business, attending conferences, meeting new people and whatnot, I, I sort of met some other investors that were more top down in nature, more macro focused. I sort of learned through my conversations with them and sort of a a variety of mentors and whatnot, that a lot of times it's a business cycle, the macroeconomic circumstances drive a lot of the price action. And depending on the market regime, it can be, uh, you know, 70%, it can be even higher. Obviously, during recessions, uh, the saying goes that a lot of correlations go to one. So I started to spend more time uh, evaluating the business cycle, analyzing the macro economy, and uh, it enhanced my bottom-up stock picking skills. Uh, I also found it really enjoyable. After a few good years at Broad Run, uh, I determined that uh, I could create more value out of my own. And so uh, that is how Invictus Research was conceived, the firm at which I now work. Invictus provides macroeconomic and market strategy research. It tends really to be almost all top-down, uh, less bottom-up, but that background and bottom-up research is really useful for communicating with my clients. So that's where I am today. Thanks. So macro drives markets. The markets are driven by the business cycle. Okay, I, I think I know what you mean, but explain what you what you mean. Like what what's an example? Uh, like over the past year, how has the uh, markets been driven by the, the macro and the business cycle? Sure. So I think macroeconomic style investing and analysis has a reputation for being kind of esoteric, and I think that intimidates a lot of people from including it in their process, which I think is a big mistake. And I think it's a mistake propagated by probably people in the industry that want to appear smarter than they are. I think the reality is that there's really only a few macroeconomic variables that really drive the price action for the major asset classes. So think stocks, bonds, commodities, and currencies. What are those variables? Real growth, inflation, and monetary policy. If you get those three variables right, you're going to get a lot of other stuff right as well. Of course, forecasting those variables isn't always easy. But in, in principle, it is relatively simple. Uh, I think that actually the last three or four years have been a really good time to be uh, involved in business cycle analysis and macroeconomics because there's obviously been a lot of stuff going on. If we just rewind the clock back to 2022, a lot of the reason that stocks traded down, you know, the NASDAQ was down 35%, uh, ARC was down something like 60%, the S&P 500 was down some 25%. And it's relatively easy to uh, attribute that price action to some macroeconomic variables, probably the most important of which was interest rates, right? So we saw you know, real interest rates increase, and depending on which one you look at, upwards of three or 400 basis points in a year. Um, you know, the, the, the price to earnings multiple, any valuation measure that you look at for stocks tends to be inversely correlated with interest rates. So rates up, stocks down, especially when you see really, really fast moves in interest rates like we did. And then in 2023, it was a little bit of a different story and a little bit and a little bit more complicated in terms of analyzing the policy. But uh, it was an, it's been an interesting year because a lot of the major risks that people were talking about in 2023 ended up being policy tailwinds. So first, the debt ceiling. Your guests have gone over this in, in more detail than, than I, I don't think I'll go into all the detail. But basically, when the Treasury general account draws down, uh, that injects reserves into the financial systems. It puts downward pressure on rates. That was a tailwind for financial assets. Uh, and then during the banking crisis in March, the Fed obviously expanded its balance sheet to establish these emergency lending facilities that also injected reserves into the financial system. That was also um, a headwind for rates, put downward pressure on rates, and was a, a tailwind for the performance of stocks. So uh, long story short, if you get the business cycle stuff right, if you get real growth, inflation, and policy right, uh, hopefully you're going to get a lot of other stuff right as well. So what has real growth and inflation been doing over, let's say, since since October, which was the bottom in the market? Since then, the stock market's been on a tear. Bond market has been performing 
mediocrely and recently just been performing very badly. So stocks outperforming bonds. Uh, I mean, what kind of signal does that send to the market? And you know, what have you been tracking on the economic side in terms of real growth inflation? Sure. So, so maybe I'll take a step back and explain how we look at the business cycle at Invictus because it's it's sort of unique. You know, ma- macro can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. So sometimes it's helpful to to zero in and really explain what we're talking about. So where does the business cycle begin? Uh, for us at Invictus, it's really with interest rates. So in late 2021 and maybe even a little before that, the Fed saw that inflation was running hot and they made the decision that they were going to raise rates. They communicated that with forward guidance at first and then eventually policy rates after that. So uh, when the Fed raises interest rates or says it's going to raise interest rates, they're not just talking about the Fed funds rate. The Fed funds rate is the policy rate or the benchmark rate that influences pretty much everything else in the U.S. interest rate complex. So uh, I think everyone knows that short rates tend to correlate very closely with the Fed funds rate. I think what a lot of people, uh, maybe macro tourists, tend to miss is that long rates also correlate very closely with the Fed funds rate. So if you look at the correlation between the 10-year yield and the Fed funds rate, it's something like 91%, excuse me, 93%. If you look at the 30-year yield and the Fed funds rate, it's about 91%. If you look at even private market interest rates, like the, the 30-year fixed mortgage rate, it tends to have about a 90, 91% correlation with the Fed funds rate as well. So the entire U.S. interest rate complex goes up with the Fed fund funds rate. It's really the most important thing to watch uh, in terms of just getting the broad interest rate you know, direction correct. And uh, so what happens when interest rates rise? Well, the 30-year fixed mortgage rate rises. That makes homes unaffordable. It puts downward pressure on demand for buying new homes. So has that happened? Yes. If you look at the MBA purchase uh, mortgage application data, it's down some 57% from its uh, uh, 2021 peak. I think it was January of 2021. Total home sales have followed suit, which makes sense. You know, financing home is less affordable, so people can't, uh, you know, buy a home for the same price that they used to be able to. So total home sales are down about 37% from their cycle peak. Uh, that matters not just because housing matters, but also because it has a significant impact on the good cycle, the manufacturing cycle. And the reason is because a lot of times, when people are buying homes, they're also buying cars or furniture or home appliances like dishwashers or washing machines. These are big, expensive, discretionary, financeable items, really uh, the items that drive the manufacturing cycle. So when demand for these goods declines, manufacturing companies cut production. They can't cut production forever uh, because you can't run a business with, with, you know, without creating and selling goods. So eventually they lay off workers. Uh, and that's how you sort of get into the recessionary sort of zone territory, right? Is that job losses start in manufacturing. Uh, they may or may not metastasize into the broader economy, but that's how slack is introduced to the labor market. You get a higher unemployment rate. The NBER makes the former formal delineation for a, a business cycle recession and so on and so forth. So where are we today? Well, you're definitely seeing, like I said earlier, all of these cyclical interest rate parts of the economy look pretty rough, right? Unsustainably. Uh, low levels of economic activity. Total home sales down almost 40% from their peak. The PMI data is still in the sort of mid 40s, sort of at a level consistent with the beginning of historical recessions. We're also seeing layoffs in the manufacturing sector and other cyclically important parts of the economy like trucking services and residential construction and uh, temporary payrolls. So I think the question now is, you know, will this metastasize into the broader economy or will it become a big enough deal that uh, you know eventually we get a recession and it starts to hit incomes and consumption and, and so on and so forth. And I think that the answer is yes, and that's what the Fed wants. And uh, you know, one way that you can tell is that they're continuing to signal they're going to raise rates and keep financial conditions relatively tight, which has uh, an impact on economic con- conditions as well. And uh, so that's where we think we are in the business cycle. Obviously, the big question is when does the unemployment rate really start to move? higher from here, because that's when people are really going to start talking about recessions. It's when the NBER will start sharpening their pencils in terms of declaring a date. Our models at Invictus right now say that the headline unemployment rate will actually remain relatively low through the end of 2023, Uh, call it 4% or maybe a a touch below. But then the brunt of the damage you're going to see in terms of sort of mass layoffs, the headline U3 unemployment rate uh, really moving higher, the nonlinear move that's really a distinctive element of recessions, that will be a, a Q1 Q2 event. And as crazy as it sounds, we think that we could see the unemployment rate above 7% by August of 2024. So why has the US economy been so robust? And I'll just give you some some numbers for real GDP growth in Q1 
it was 2%. And in Q2, 2.4%. This is real. So adjusted for inflation. If it was nominal, you get in four, five, six percent growth, which is, you know, needless to say, not a recession. And then for real GDP for the third quarter, the Atlanta Fed is now casting 5.8% growth, which again is inflate adjusted for inflation. So that's like seven percent or eight percent nominal growth. So why uh do you is it fair to say that the US economy has reaccelerated? Uh, from uh, the trough in the summer of, of 2022? Uh, and if you don't say it has accelerated, uh, why? So I think it's important to talk about where this is happening in the economy, right? So a lot of what you're describing is happening in the services sector. And that's not to dismiss its importance or the fact that it uh, is happening, but it's not happening in those leading cyclically sensitive parts of the economy that I mentioned earlier. And the fact of the matter is that you know, incomes are still strong. If you look at the last income and outlays report, um, wages and salary disbursements from corporations, which is a, you know, a very good proxy for what you're getting deposited directly into your bank account at the end of each month, was up uh, 6% year over year and 6.5% on a three-month annualized basis. That's a, a result of basically being at 36 unemployment 3.6% unemployment rate and seeing wage growth in the 4 to 5% range, depending on which measure you look at. And uh, so when incomes are strong, people are going to spend money. That's why, um, you know, that's why we've had an inflation problem. That's why we're still seeing growth pretty strong. I think something that people talk a lot about the Fed creating money, uh, which is true, but I think something that is under acknowledged is that the Fed not only creates money, but also influences where that money is spent. When, when mortgage rates or interest rates in general are very expensive, that's going to direct the flow of incomes and consumption into things like services, right? Uh, so I, I mentioned to you yesterday, my wife and I are looking at a couch. It's, it's from Costco. So it's, you know, uh, sort of the value, it's sort of the value end of the furniture spectrum, but it's still $2,000, right? $2,000 for, you know, most of America is a pretty big, expensive uh, item. So when given the choice between you know, buying a $2,000 couch or going to see Barbie or, or Oppenheimer, if you only have, you know, a thousand, I don't remember what the statistic is, but if you only have a thousand dollars in your bank account, it's a no brainer. You're going to go enjoy a weekend of, uh, you know, Oppenheimer and you're, you'll spend 30 bucks instead of spending 2000 bucks. And so the Fed is in a way forcing incomes and spending into a certain part of the economy, uh, which is services, which tends to be, you know, s s smaller items and more affordable uh, given most people's budgets and given what financing and how expensive financing is right now. So, so the Federal Reserve controls um, interest rates, short-term interest rates. How does that lead to people not being able to afford a couch? And also I'd say in the couch buyers, a couch being $2,000 is very bad for the economy of the couch buyer, but it's very good for the couch seller. And the couch seller, you know, they've got owners and people who work at the So in the private sector, you know, a $2,000 couch, you could say, Actually, uh, an economy that can, uh, um, you know, even have the gall to sell a couch for two thousand dollars is one that you know someone's buying it. You know, you know what I mean? Uh, inflation, and it's not a not a recessionary signal. But in what way do you say the Federal Reserve is because because the aggregate level of bank deposits is yes con is affected by the by the Federal Reserve? But how much money is in people's bank accounts? That has a lot of to do with income. JP Morgan had this survey. We discussed it a little bit uh, about how, you know, if someone had $1,000 in their bank account in 2019, they had something like $1,500 uh, at the peak, and now they have something like $1,200. So it's gone down. But the amount of you know money in people's bank accounts and that's pretty good. You got to look at that. If you, you know, that's a pretty good economic indicator is, uh, st you know, still well above 20, 2019 levels. So, uh, a lot of, a lot of good points, uh, made there. I would point, point out a couple of things. So a, a lot of people have been talking about excess savings. So if you just look at the personal savings data from the income and outlays report, and you draw a trend line from say 2016 to 2019, and you take the, uh, you know, the, the value of the months above that trend line and you subtract, uh, you know, that was through all this period of stimulus, right, in 2020 and 21. And then you subtract uh, 2022 and 23, where we've seen relative disk savings, uh, you get an excess savings number, sort of a, a stock and flow measure. Uh, there was about $2 trillion of excess savings at its peak. I think that was in 2021. Um, our work at Invicta shows that that number is now down to below 150 billion. So uh, you know, five five percent of that peak number. 
So are, is there still some excess savings? Probably so. But given uh, our models, we think that will be almost completely run off over the next month or so. So we wouldn't count on excess savings being a, a, you know, a tailwind for consumption for all that much longer. Uh, I also think it's important to acknowledge that a lot of these conversations about excess savings or checkable deposits uh, don't really account for wealth distribution. And obviously that's an important variable because a lot of this, a lot of these deposits end up in the hands of people that own businesses or financial assets, which is to say kind of the top 1% of consumers, and they have a very low marginal propensity to consume. Uh, and if you look at statistics that describe sort of the, the bottom end of the income distribution, uh, they're not doing quite as well. So those savings statistics really aren't so relevant. And we actually just got the data on charge-offs and delinquencies from the Federal Reserve Board yesterday. And if you look at credit card delinquencies, which uh, is generally a good measure for sort of working class people, because uh, the top 1% is generally not running super high levels of revol revolving credit card debt. They generally pay their balances on time. They're probably not going to be delinquent. Um, it's up 118 basis points over the last two years. And that's significant. It's actually even just in absolute terms above 2019 levels right now. So I think it's easy to look at statistics like checkable de total checkable deposits from the Federal Reserve Board and say, well, they, they seem really high relative to pre-COVID levels, but they don't actually do a good job of describing the median consumer in the U.S. economy. And from a forecasting perspective, or in terms of setting your expectations about where the economy is likely to go, uh, and Victor, we don't think that they're all that useful. So I would agree with you that the aggregate, yeah, whatever you find on Fred, the macro data is not, is not useful. But I uh, do pay a lot of attention to what's released from like Bank of America and JP Morgan. And I, I can send it to you. They actually, so that's a great point about the distribution of, of wealth effects. And yeah, uh, excess savings went from 50 billion to a trillion. You know, if it's all in Bill Gates' bank account, it has almost zero economic significance. But they do break it out by by cohort. And and uh, it, it does show that like all, all across the spectrum, there's there's more money um, in people's in people's accounts. Okay, so so is the economy slowing down right now? And are we in a recession? Do you expect a recession? And then how does that uh, impact your 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 asset allocation outlook? So I think I think the answer is yes. And I'll move the conversation quickly away from GDP because it's just not our favorite measure of the growth cycle at Invictus. Generally, we're looking at. Uh, you know, I'm, I, we're looking e pretty evenly at production data, income data, consumption data, and employment data. Those four categories tend to be correlated, although on varying leads and lags, employment tends to be the lagging most indicator. When we look at all of those, all of that data together, it does say that the U.S. economy continues to slow in aggregate. Uh, in terms of when that, you know, hits in terms of a, a formal recession, uh, well, like I said, really, the, the labor market data is always the lagging most indicator. And when that hits, that tends to be when you see, uh, you know, the odds of a recession go really, really high. And usually the NBER will make that uh, declaration several months later when it's not super helpful. Uh, our expectation is that, you know, if we had to throw a wild guess out there in terms of when the NBER will, will actually make that statement, we think maybe it'll be December of this year. But the bulk of the damage in terms of the unemployment rate, we think, is Q1 and Q2. Asset allocation ahead of that. Uh, right now, our favorite asset allocation choice is short-term treasury bills. I know that's an incredibly boring answer. It's not an original answer at all. But look, you know, 5.5% nominally risk-free uh, paper at this point in the cycle we think is attractive. Generally, one of the best allocation choices headed into a recession is uh, long-term government bonds. We think it's too early to make that call. Right. Uh, we think that the 10-year the Treasury yield, the 30-year yield can still move higher from here. Um, one, because the Fed is likely, in our view, more likely than the market is pricing in to hike one more time uh, and perhaps even two more times through year end. And um, on top of that, the Treasury is introducing a ton of duration into the market. We're still, you know, we're still doing $85 billion of QT, which no one seems to be talking about anymore. All of that will be introducing uh, a lot of strong upward influence on the back end of the yield curve. So we don't really, at this cycle, we don't think it's a good idea to buy duration until we really see the whites of the eyes uh, of the recession. Sorry to interrupt, wanted to let you know about Blockworks upcoming crypto event, Permissionless 2. This ultimate DeFi gathering will be taking place in Austin on the 11th to the 13th of September, 2023. It will feature the very best discussions on ZK tech, rollups, account abstraction, MEV, and much, much more. All the big hitters in crypto are gonna be there. So if you're into crypto, you need to be there too. 
To get a 20% discount to a full three-day pass to Permissionless 2, click the link in the description and use code GUIDANCE20. That's GUIDANCE20. Thanks, let's get back to the episode. You said the NBA yard will declare a recession in December. That, that That's when the December will start. What do your back tests indicate about duration, when to buy, uh, you know, long-term government bonds that appreciate in value, you know, price up, yields down when we enter recession. And in terms about the timing, because for example, you know, when the yield curve first inverted in the, I think the spring of 2022, people said, oh, buy government bonds. That was obviously a disaster. Um, what, yeah, what, what does your back test indicate about when is the time to buy bonds? And how does that apply to this cycle? When we're what, um, I'm not very good at math, but you know, four, four months away from when we would enter a recession. Right. So there are a lot of different indicators you can use to try and determine the best time to buy long-term government bonds. A lot of people look at various measures of yield curvature. Um, you know, a lot of people have said, well, you know, when the three-month tenure inverts, that's when you start buying bonds. When maybe a short-term measure of curvature inverts, maybe the three-month, two-year, that's when you want to start, you know, going out on the, the spectrum of duration. And Victus, we found the most useful way of thinking about it is that when the Fed uh, starts cutting rates, actively cutting rates. That's, that's really the best time to start buying government bonds. And you're probably going to be a little bit late if you, if you go by that rule, right? Because the, the, the long end of the curve will start to discount slower growth conditions before the Fed formally announces it's cutting. But if you want a, a more reliable way to get into bonds, and you'll still, you know, generally the Fed doesn't cut, cut 25 basis points at a time. It cuts in rather large increments. So you'll still catch a lot of the move. Um, that's, that's the way that we would think about it. at Invec So you said normally the Fed doesn't cut by 25 basis points at a time. And you're right. Uh, 2007, 2008, boom, 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 financial crisis. We need zero interest rates now. And uh, March, 2020, we need zero interest rates now. We're going to cut in between a meeting, which you know, is a sign of a true emergency. Um, but that was you know, March, 2020, an intentional shutdown of the global economy. 2008, the financial plumbing of the global economy financial system, you know, melting down and, and bursting. Those were emergencies. And it seems, sounds like what you're saying, or maybe you're, you're not, is something above more a vanilla recession, a kind of 1990, 1991, a 2001, 2002 recession. And uh, I mean, how bad do you think it's going to be? Because to get, you know, 50 basis points, 50 basis points, 50 basis points of cuts, you really have to, you know, have some severe uh, economic damage. What is the culprit? Uh, what is the exogenous force that is going to, you know, not just cause a mild recession, which, you know, that that for sure that could, that could happen, but a somewhat severe recession, which sounds like you're you're pricing in when you say a seven percent unemployment rate. Right. So it's very hard to forecast the severity of a recession. It's almost impossible to forecast major systemic risk events like you know the financial system breaking down or, or COVID. So we generally shy away from that. I, I will say though that. Generally, the severity and, and speed of a recession is commensurate with the speed and severity of the interest rate hikes that precede it, right? And we've seen the most rapid interest rate hiking cycle since Paul Volcker in the early 1980s. And uh, what that suggests is that we should see a worse than average recession. We should see a greater than average increase in the unemployment rate. Now, you know, keep in mind, we're not talking about another great financial crisis or another COVID type event. We're not talking about a 10% unemployment rate, but uh, we are talking about something like a doubling of the unemployment rate, uh, which, you know, markets will trade down on that pretty aggressively. It'll trade like a trade like you would expect a recession should. Um, so uh, yeah, that, that, that's kind of our base case. But you know, when you're in the middle of a, a recession and the unemployment rate is going up and the market's dropping uh, 200 base, you know, 200 points a day, uh, you know, you, you have to adjust as new information comes in. So that's our base case right now. But uh, you know, as as more data comes in, and you know, we get closer to the event, our, our views will probably, you know, they'll no doubt change. Uh, you know, as we as we get more data. What leads you to forecast a se above seven percent unemployment rates? Is it just the uh, the extent of the Federal Reserve's hikes? Tell tell me about that. Sure. So you could use an you know basically an interest rate model that looks at the correlation between changes in interest rates and the unemployment rate. Given that we've seen a really dramatic increase in rates, obviously that's indicating that we see a more dramatic, you know, a relatively dramatic increase in the unemployment rate. You could look at the NAHB Home Builder Sentiment Index. It tends to lead the headline unemployment rate by 18 months. And if you look at the correlation prior to COVID, where the correlation broke down for kind of obvious reasons, uh, it's, it's about an 85% correlation. So it's a very good leading indicator. And if you just run a regression, the decline in the NAHB index in 2022 indicates that we'll see 
7.3% unemployment by August of 2024. If you look at the net percentage of uh, commercial banks tightening their lending standards, that's another time series that leads the headline unemployment rate. Uh, it's also indicating that we see upward of 7% inflation, excuse me, upward of 7% unemployment by Q3 of 2024. And, you know, generally speaking, when all of your leading indicators are saying more or less the same thing, uh, you know, your, your risk antenna should be up and you should be, you should be looking at the labor market very closely. So, you know, all, all of these indicators together are what um, are setting our expectations for a rather rapid in, you know, increase in the unemployment rate uh, through 2024. Given that you know rising interest rates, the Federal Reserve has been rising interest rates since March. Uh, so for you know pretty much a year year and a half, are you surprised that it's taken this long for the economy to slow and the the, the unemployment rate to go up? Given that you know in March 2022 when interest rates were at zero and the Fed raised them for the first time, the unemployment rate was at 3.6 percent, and now the unemployment rate is at 3.5 percent. It sounds like you're not convinced that you know we have a secularly tight labor market, which will be a you know, a tailwind for inflation for you know a long time. Even if we do have a secularly tight labor market, which I think certainly is not out of the question, um, it doesn't preclude or it doesn't preclude a recession where the unemployment rate goes up. In terms of the leads and lags, uh, you know, there you, it depends on the the part of the economy that you're looking at. Again, right, the the lead time between interest rate increases and declines in mortgage applications is maybe a month. It's very very short. It's very predictable. Uh, it's not what Milton Friedman would say, long and variable, right? You know, rates up, mortgage applications down, total home sales fall quickly. All of that is uh, sort of at the front end of the of the business cycle or of a downdraft in the business cycle, so to speak. The bigger question is when do you start to see layoffs? Uh, because that, you know, entails sort of discretion from management and does it metastasize into services and, and so on and so forth. And we know that so one of the one of the measures of the growth cycle that we really like at Invictus is the ISM manufacturing PMI. So if you look at changes in interest rates and the influence they exert on the manufacturing PMI, it's generally about 16 months, um, you know, give or take their sort of confidence intervals around that. Um, you know, that would indicate that we should start to see some some real manufacturing pain uh, in you know Q Q Q4 of this year, right? And we've already seen some manufacturing pain, you know, already, right? The PMI is at about 46. It's kind of a, a recessionary level. So I don't know. I think the business cycle is progressing probably more or less as you would expect, given historical leads and lags. Uh, I think we just saw a lot of money printing. We're still seeing considerable fiscal stimulus. I mean, if you look at federal outlays as a percentage of GDP, they're upward of 6% currently. And basically, that's that's a recessionary level of outlays of, of spending. The, gov the federal government is spending money like there's a crisis or a recession when there's not. And that's continuing to juice you know, spending in certain categories like services, right? And understandably. So, um, you know, I think the big question is when is the headline unemployment rate going up? Uh, you know, the historical leads and lags suggest that the really aggressive increases will be in Q1 and Q2 of 2024. That said, could it be a little bit earlier or a little bit later? Yeah, I, I think it could. But but right now, I don't think I don't think there have been any major shocks to it, like traditional business cycle thesis. Got it. Uh, okay. And so, from the beginning of the IS, first of all, you know the PMI above a reading above fifty indicates growth. A reading above below fifty indicates contraction. This is a real key point I want to ask you about, which is about base effects. Which is that a rate going down is not the same as a the underlying phenomenon going down. For example, in twenty Q four twenty twenty one, I was talking to a really smart you know macro investor. And he said, well, growth's going to go down, so it's time to buy bonds. And I, you know, I, I don't make a good point often. I probably make a good point maybe you know, once, once or twice a quarter. So when I do make a good point, I remember it. And I, but, so growth was at 12%. I said, if growth goes down from 12% to 9%, is that really a good time to buy bonds? Just because your, your back test says yes, because in your back test, your growth wasn't at 12%. When growth goes from 5% to 1%, that's a great time to buy bonds because the economy is entering a slowdown or a recession. But 9% sounds like a pretty good growth. Uh, period for me. So, uh, you know, like now we're at 6% growth and, you know, we, we definitely are probably sl slowing down more. So maybe that argument uh, is, has you know, reached its uh, conclusion because we're, we're getting down pretty close. But on the PMIs, uh, if, if, you, if the economy is booming, for example, if there's like an airline PMI, there's not, but there, let's just say, uh, mm -hmm. maybe 
it, it is, I mean, it is probably the hottest time to be an airline since a very, very, very long time right now. But if it's slowing down, that would be a PMI of 45. But it's slowing down from such absurdly high levels that it's, it, you know, a slowdown from absurdly high levels is not a recession. It's just less insanely high. Likewise, bank lending standards were incredibly loose in 2022. And so they're net tightening from absurdly loose levels. So, you know, if it's a, if a seven foot tall man, you know, shrinks and he's now 6'10", he's not short. You, you know, what do, what do you think about that argument? And, and I think a lot of that P, P, I mean, PMIs is, is all based on rate of change levels. Right. So uh, I agree with what you're saying. A few a few comments. First of all, I think it's important not to overstate how hot the U.S. economy is. If you were to take a, a trend line and look at pre-COVID growth, you could look at real GDP. You could look at income data. You could look at industrial production. You can pick your take your take your pick as long as it's not consumption, really. Yeah. <laughs> Spending. <laughs> yeah, they're all below trend, right? So the economic recovery has. You know, there has been an economic recovery, but it's not like the U.S. economy is so, so hot relative to history. Sorry, I meant in 2021 and in 2021, it was so hot. So a slowdown from 2021 is still not a recession. That's what I was saying. I'm not saying it's so hot now. Well, again, it depends on where you look. A lot of these measures never recovered their their, their level of trend growth. Like what? Like what? Most of them. So look at real GDP. It never recovered its level of trend growth. That's the I think what most people think is the most comprehensive measure. You could look at personal income or real personal income, uh, West transfers, which is kind of the, the level that the NBER looks at. The thing that's really above trend is consumption, and that's largely a result of money printing. And when the difference in growth and consumption outpaces the difference in growth and output, that's when you see inflation, hence you know, the highest inflation since the 1970s. What, so, so real, real gro- uh, growth, maybe b- below trend, uh, now, but not nominal, pretty much everything it was above trend in 2021, correct? Except for industrial production, maybe. Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Well, and if you think about it, industrial production is a measure of output, which isn't to say it's unaffected by inflation or, or money printing, but uh, it tends to naturally track real statistics a little bit better. Yeah, but it's also a small fraction of the economy. Most, most, you know, most people do not work in a factory in America. Uh, Yes, that's true. You can also look at other measures of output. So, for example, if you took the sum of uh, growth in the growth in the labor market, right, growth in payrolls, and you added to it growth in uh, productivity, that's another measure of output that that's likewise been very shockingly soft, mostly because of weak productivity data. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I don't understand productivity at all. So, we'll, 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 let's move on. <laughs> yes, it's, no one does. So PMIs, for as long as PMIs have been in existence until 2019, they've had a strong correlation, as you said. When PMIs go down, typically interest rates go down. Uh, when PMIs go down, the stock market performs not as well. When, you know, when PMIs go up, interest rates go up, spending goes up. But I feel like the, has the correlation broken down over the past uh, three years, given that, I mean, yeah, PMIs went from 60 to 45 and interest rates went up. That is a pretty big question mark. That's a pretty throwing a, throwing a wrench in the model, right? Right, and you and you brought up a great point earlier. So, what re- if you look at any back test and economic growth, and you and you look at it, the performance of of bonds, especially government bonds, they're all going to say that bonds perform better when growth is slowing. But growth is not the direct driver of of bond performance or of bond yields. The direct driver, or the most direct driver, is Fed policy, right? So, if you were to run an attribution, you'd see that Fed policy accounts for about 95% of the price action in short rates. And it accounts for about 80% of the price action, even in long rates, right? So, you know, the first reason that we've seen bonds perform really, really poorly, despite slowing growth, is that we've seen inflation run hot and the Fed has kept rates high. That's really the important thing. You have to understand that the principal driver of rates, it's not economic growth, even though growth does matter. It's, it's what the Fed is doing. So because inflation is, is still really hot and because the underlying drivers of inflation, you know, low productivity, rapid income growth, like I said, between six and six and a half percent, the Fed has not had the breathing room to cut rates or even to stop raising rates. Because the unemployment rate is 3.5%. And I, I think that's related to, to my point of if, if the economy slows from 5% growth to 1% growth, the unemployment rate is probably going to tick up and the pressure is going to be on the Fed to cut rates or at least stop hiking them. But when you slow from 12% growth to 6% growth, 
that's still a boom, not as hot of a boom, but it's still a booming economy. And the unemployment rate is going to be at 3.5%. Inflation's hot. So yeah, Fed is going to hike, 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 and then bonds don't do well. Exactly right. Yeah. So the, the long and the long and short of the story is if you want to get bonds right, you have to really watch the Fed. And it's important to track the economy as well. But the Fed is what matters most. And when you're looking at the economy, it helps to look at it the way the Fed looks at it. So when the Fed says, these are the criteria we're looking at in terms of making policy decisions about hiking or cutting rates, uh, even if you think the Fed is stupid, even if you think, you know, Jay Powell is a terrible Fed chair or whatever, you have to you have to invest according to his criteria. You can't invest according to your own, or you're going to buy the you know the long term treasury bond and and you know draw down thirty <laughs> percent over fifteen months in the safest asset in the world. Yeah, so I'm going to take a guess and say that your models also say that when the economy is slowing down, uh, overweight stocks relative to bonds on you know, an asset allocation, overweight you know uh, cyclicals, uh, excuse me, un- overweight um, consumer staples and healthcare and maybe technology and underweight cyclical things like energy materials, home builders. Is that your recommended asset allocation now or is it slightly different? More more or less, I would say. But you have to be a little bit careful because policy also matters quite a bit. And uh, you know, if you look look at the beginning of 2023, the growth situation wasn't great, but you saw cyclicals outperform defensives by a very wide margin. And that's really because if you look at the constituents of you know the, the various um, cyclical sectors. There's a lot of technology in the U.S., a lot of discretionary, which again, in the U.S. includes things like Amazon, which are sort of more technology oriented. Communications is essentially technology. And so when you're buying cyclicals, you're also buying quite a bit of duration risk. And as a result of the drawdown in the, in the Treasury General account, and as a result of the Fed expanding its balance sheets, its balance sheet rates went down and you saw all of these cyclical sectors really, really outperform. Uh, and so that's just to say- When? This year? Yes. Yeah. In 2023, cyclicals have outperformed defensives by a pretty wide margin. And the question okay. is, was that outperformance attributable to faster economic growth? Maybe, to, especially to the extent that you know we, we have seen spending squeeze into services, but a lot of it was policy, right? A lot of it was what the Fed was doing. So not to make this all about the Fed, but it's, <laughs> it is really, really important. So what are some of your favorite sectors in the stock market right now? And what least favorite? It's a tricky question right now. Um, one of my favorite sectors or, or industries rather is home builders. Uh, from a tactical perspective, uh, a lot of home builders are kind of right below support. If you look at XHB, which is a home builder ETF, it's it's right below, uh, excuse me, resistance, not support. It's right below resistance at about $85 a share. Generally at Invictus, we don't like buying things right below resistance. We like to, to buy breakouts. However, when you consider the fundamental backdrop for home builders, I think it's quite constructive. It's, I think it's quite constructive, you know, over the short term, call it the next two or three months. And I think it's quite constructive over the longer term, call it five years out. And uh, the big reason, so in the short term, the big reason that uh, the, 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 the fundamental backdrop is constructive is because there's no inventory of existing homes. So all, all activity is getting squeezed into new homes, right? So uh, people that own homes right now don't want to sell it because mortgage rates are really, really high. The average yield on a on a mortgage right now is like three point six percent. So if you have the choice as an existing homeowner between a three point six percent note on your existing home or going out and refinancing it over seven percent, it's a no brainer. So people just aren't moving. But what that means is uh, activity is getting squeezed into new homes. Right, home builders are the only source of supply on the market, and they can alleviate the impact of higher rates on consumers by providing inducements like buying down interest rates. Right, so. That's why you've seen home builders as one of the top performing industries and through, you know, post post June of 2022 and then through a lot of 2023 as well. Has the dynamic changed? No, I think the NAHB index ticked down about six points in August. And I think a lot of people were like, well, this is it. It's rolling over. You know, home builders are going to roll over, too. And, you know, this is the end of their little bull run, maybe. But the fundamentals really haven't changed. The supply situation is still incredibly tight. If you look at total active listings which is sort of the best, most comprehensive measure of supply. It's down 75% today from its high in 2007, right? That's kind of a longer term statistic, but I think it's important for context. There really is just, just no supply out there. And if you look at uh, the year over year rate of change in active listings or days on the market, they're all moving in the wrong direction. Not only is supply tight, but it's continuing to get tighter. Who benefits from this? Well, it's, it's probably home builders. Could a recession derail that thesis? temporarily because people just completely stop spending money as the unemployment rate goes up? Yes. 
Um, but I think the truth is when you look at the supply situation over the long term, you know, we're just missing a lot of homes. There needs to be more supply introduced. And, you know, that's that's going to come from home builders. It can't come from anywhere else. And, uh, you know, that's that's essentially the bull case. So home builders are probably our favorite exposure. We like some semiconductor plays like tactically on artificial intelligence. But candidly, our outlook on the stock market is not super bullish right now, right? Obviously, we think there's going to be a recession sort of beginning at the latest in early 2024. And through then, we're going to see, I think, financial conditions continuing to tighten as a result of $85 billion a month in QT, as a result of you know, $2 trillion in, in treasury issuance in the back half of the year. There are just a lot of headwinds for financial conditions leading up into that recessionary time period that make it very constructive to be bullish on the broader indexes. Okay, so home builders, you laid out a compelling long-term fundamental case to be bullish uh, home builders. But isn't that, aren't you putting on your old hat of when you were at the fundamental hedge fund that you worked at? And it was also a long-term view in the same way that over the long term, stocks are going to outperform cash. It's, you know, very like, you know, it's, it's kind of a shoe in to outperform you, you know, cash on a 30 year basis. But when you say when you're recommending cash over stocks now, that's because you're tactical macro asset allocation. But on a macro trading, you know, one year, two year, even three year time horizon, it's yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, a huge recession where you know, uh, unemployment rate goes above 7%, maybe even way above it. That sounds like a real headwind for uh, home builders. I mean, if, if unemployment rate goes up, I, home prices probably go down. And they could go down a lot. And home builders own a lot of homes. And so they're going to have to have a pretty giant write down. Uh, why, why are you so bullish, you, despite the fundamental backdrop, which is kind of a long term view, I understand, but isn't your macro view of we're heading for a giant recession? I mean, a back test must say that home builders do very poorly in a recession, right? I mean, because of 2006, 2009. <laughs> Right. Yeah. I mean, there's there's no doubt that if there's a recession, home builders, the correlations are going to go to one. On top of that, home building is a consumer discretionary sub industry, right? And homes are the biggest, most expensive discretionary decisions that people make. So it's not a recession call. It's just an acknowledgement that the fundamental conditions for long term outperformance are there. And even short term outperformance, it's just more on a 12 month basis. Having any, you know, ha having a lot of exposure to equities is just a challenge for us. Um, that said, we do spend some time on longer term themes, um, you know, like, like what's going on with home builders, like long term drivers of, of productivity and the labor force. So we're not just tactical, even though we do spend a lot of time on, you know, economic regimes and market regimes that tend to last, you know, 18 months or so in, in, in duration. It's helpful to understand the long term, even if you're more focused on the short term from the perspective of making investment decisions. Got it. So. How do you also interpret the very uh, tightness in credit spreads, meaning you know, investors are not really demanding a lot of compensation for taking credit risk for buying investment grade or, or high yield bonds? And there's kind of a, you know, a boom in private credit now. Uh, I mean, if we're headed for a recession, isn't the bond market supposed to be smart? I mean, if we're A, headed for a recession, that's imminent and going to be big, and B, the bond market is the truth. Uh, I'm, by the way, I'm, I'm more convinced of A than I am of B. Um, but I'm skeptical of both. Uh, if A and B are true, then the following would likely happen, right? Uh, Long-term bonds would be rallying and credit spreads would be widening. We're seeing the exact opposite. Credit spreads are tightening and they've been very tight. Uh, so the credit market is loose. And then long-term bonds, uh, you know, the 10-year, the 30-year are selling off in, in droves. So what's going on there? So I guess a few things. First of all, we're clearly not in a recession right now. Uh, that's what credit spreads are saying. Uh, it's also just apparent from looking at the unemployment rate. A lot of a lot of the questions about strong, you know, why does the economy seem so resilient? It's just when you're at three and a half percent unemployment, and when you're seeing five percent wage growth, that necessarily mean income means income growth is strong, and that you're going to see a lot of money getting spent on stuff. Um, you know, why are credit spreads so narrow despite the fact that in rate of change terms growth has been slowing? I mean, that's a great question, right? It's a it's a divergence relative to history. Usually when growth is slowing, credit spreads are uh, expanding. It's, it's kind of more risk off in nature. And when growth is accelerating, credit spreads are contracting. Uh, credit spreads have been contracting since June, despite the fact that most of the growth data we track has continued to slow. So I think the question when you see an economic divergence like this is which way does the divergence resolve, right? Is growth going to reaccelerate or are credit spreads eventually going to expand again? 
And it's always a question of the weight of the evidence, right? Anytime you're trying to evaluate the economy or, you know, financial asset and figure out which way it's going, you're, you're looking at the weight of the evidence. And there's always going to be uh, evidence that things are going to get better. And there's always going to be some evidence that things are getting worse. And you just have to determine, you know, uh, you know, where is the evidence most persuasive? And in our view, Invictus, we think most of the evidence points to the fact that growth is going to continue to slow when the labor market, you know, if and when the labor market gives out, you'll see the rate of change of that slowdown uh, become much more dramatic. And we think in that environment, credit spreads probably do expand. I'll also add that while credit spreads are a decent leading indicator for growth, if you look at the relationship between, uh, say, triple C spreads and the ISM manufacturing PMI, the correlation is about negative 75%, they're inverse, and credit spreads lead by a month. That said, 75% correlation isn't that high, and there are plenty of examples of recessions where credit spreads weren't a terrific leading indicator. Right. If you look at credit spreads leading into the great financial crisis, which was the biggest credit event since the 1930s, uh, credit spreads weren't a great leading indicator. They were very, very flat heading into the recession or COVID for that example. Right. Credit spreads were very, very tight uh, leading into COVID. They weren't a great leading indicator. There were other leading indicators. If you looked at stock market internals, uh, if you looked at the FX markets, obviously, but, but credit spreads weren't really it. Um, so that's just to say, while credit spreads are important and we do pay close attention to credit spreads, they're not the end all, they're not the end all be all, they're not all knowing, uh, you know, they're, they're just one input. I'll also add one more note. I think this has probably been discussed on your show before, but generally speaking, credit spreads tend to track the net percentage of commercial banks tightening their lending standards, which makes sense. You could almost think of one as private financing and one as sort of, uh, public financing for larger companies. And the net percentage of banks tightening their lending standards is very, very high. It's suggestive of uh, credit spreads that are, I forget the exact number, but if you run a regression, it's 300 or 400 basis points higher than they are today. Uh, that would be recessionary uh, if it were to take place. And I know there's, you could make the case that, well, hey, this isn't a, a credit-driven business cycle. This is more of an income-driven business cycle. And I appreciate those nuances. That said, if the unemployment rate goes up, that's going to put downward pressure on incomes and consumption production likely as well. And that almost always leads to, to, uh, to credit events, right? And, uh, and if there is a credit event, we, we really see no other outcome other than higher, higher spreads. Going back to the PMI, so the composite PMI bottomed in, I guess, what, October or uh, probably December, actually, just about 45, 44. But it's, it's gone up since then. And manufacturing has also gone up since then. And composite is, is manufacturing and services. So yeah, why is the the composite PMI gone from 46 to 52. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, why do you expect it to decline? Uh, are you looking at the ISM data or the S&P data? Um, sorry, S&P, S&P. So we generally spend more time looking at the ISM data and Vectus, it tends to be sort of the gold standard for the PMI data in our view. And uh, the reason that we, the reason that I say that is for a few reasons. I mean, it's timely, it's relatively accurate. Um, but another big reason is that it's got a long, long history for backtesting, and it tends to have a very close correlation with a lot of tradable risk exposures. So if you look at the performance of the S&P 500, it tends to trade pretty closely atop the ISM manufacturing PMI. If you look at credit spreads, generally trades inversely with the, the PMI data, like we just talked about the dollar, same thing. Uh, so the PMI data is really, really important. And what it represents is really, really important. Um, you know, what's... If you look at a composite and it's going higher than the manufacturing data, I guess first I would say that generally speaking, risk assets trade with a closer correlation to the manufacturing data and S&P 500 earnings tend to have a closer correlation with the uh, manufacturing data. But, uh, you know, there's probably also some compositional differences between the ISM and the S&P data that I'm just not privy to. Got it. Okay, so now let's talk about spending. I think real services spending is up 7.5% year over year. Adjusting for inflation, it's up 2% year over year. So, I mean, Americans are just spending, 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 and hard for there to be recession when people are spending this much money. What stops this? So consumer spending can be decomposed into two parts, growth in employment and growth in salaries and wages. Uh, generally, those two things are related. They both reflect supply and demand for labor. I think the short answer is a higher unemployment rate. Uh, if the unemployment rate, rate goes up, uh, wage growth goes down. Obviously, growth in payrolls is probably negative. 
Uh, that means income income goes from six percent or six and a half percent today to something below zero. With no more incomes, people stop spending as much money. I think that's the that's how I would set my expectations going forward. Got it. So higher unemployment will result in lower spending. What's going to lead to higher unemployment? So I think it'll be manufacturing layoffs, right? And and, and layoffs and cyclical interest rate sensitive parts of the economy. So if you look at the, I realize I'm cherry picking a kind of a bearish data point here, but if you look at the ADP non-farm payrolls data for manufacturing, there were 36,000 net layoffs uh, last month, so it's net of new hires. And if you look back over the last five months, we're at nearly 200,000 net layoffs. I think you have to ask yourself, uh, why are manufacturing companies laying people off like this? If they expect business conditions to improve, they probably wouldn't do so, uh, but they are. And eventually these manufacturing, we're also seeing this, like I said, in, in temporary payrolls, uh, we're seeing it in trucking services, we're seeing it in residential construction. The question is, will it metastasize? Will we continue to see layoffs in these sectors? And at Invictus, I, you know, the house view is that the answer is yes, right? As long as mortgage rates are above 7%, the tenure is increasing and we think it continues to increase. This is gonna to continue to reduce demand for a lot of the services and products that these companies provide. And uh, as business conditions get worse, they're more likely to weigh people off. That will put upward pressure on the unemployment rate if it gets bad enough, and we think it will, um, which will hit incomes and spending, which will be spending on services, not just goods, right? And that's how you see weakness metastasize into the services sector. You'll start to see people working at restaurants lose their jobs or people in the entertainment industry and so on and so forth, financial services. Uh, you could go on and on. So manufacturing tends to lead weakness in the labor market. And, uh, and through some recessions, it spreads into services, through other, others, it doesn't. But it, Historically, most of the time, even the weakness in the cyclical parts of the economy is enough to induce an NBER recession and poor performance from stocks. And what industries, when you say manufacturing, factories, what, what industries are going to be hit? Because we know it's not going to be home builders, right? Because home builders are going to be on, on a tear uh, because of you know, low, invent low inventory. So you know, people are going to be building houses, people are going to be selling new houses, not existing but what are you thinking? Is it cars, durable goods? Like, is there any particular area of weakness that you're kind of flagging? Yeah, dur durable goods will be probably hit the hardest, right? So your autos is an obvious example, extremely cyclical. You see, you know, sometimes upwards of 50% declines in, in auto volumes through a recession. The data has actually been pretty good in autos recently, not because demand has been super strong relative to history, but because there have been a ton of supply chain constraints that are being removed. What's interesting is if you look at the stock of companies like GM or Ford, traditional automakers, they're performing absolutely terribly. I mean, they're still down, I think over 40, maybe 45% from their cycle peaks. Um, you know, the charts are a total mess. They're, they're clearly still in very formal downtrends, right? Lower highs and lower lows. And I think that's symptomatic of, you know, yes, supply chains are improving, but they're improving against the backdrop of very weak demand where the cost of financing is very, very high. And the median car buyer, you know, the median U.S. consumer is really not all that strong. So we would expect autos to perform poorly through a recession, as well as furniture makers, as well as companies like, you know, Whirlpool or, or RH. I will say uh, home builders probably will not do well through a recession. Uh, houses are big, expensive. You know, if you see income growth go from 6% to 0%, you're probably going to see home builders take a hit. I wouldn't want to own home builders through a recession. I would, I probably want to be nimble and, and sort of risk manage around those positions with uh, the, the hope of, of, you know, sort of buying the dip in those names. I'll also say something that you mentioned earlier, do home prices go down through recessions? And the rate of change in home price appreciation usually declines, but it's actually somewhat unusual to see home prices decline in absolute terms through recessions. In aggregate, yeah. In aggregate, right. The big counter example is through the great financial crisis, which was sort of much more housing related than a typical recession. We saw home prices decline 25%. But it, I think the supply situation is so different now than uh, the great financial crisis that, that an analogy doesn't really make any sense. Like I mentioned earlier, total active listings are down 75% from 2007 against the backdrop of a US population that's 15% larger, 15% more people that need shelter. So, you know, unless interest rates go to 10%, which is certainly not my base case, it's hard for me to imagine that we see a dramatic decline in home prices from here. What do you think is your outlook on inflation and interest rates? Where is inflation headed? And also in a recession, where do interest rates go? Presumably not higher and presumably maybe the Federal Reserve cuts. 
But I mean, are we going back to 0% or are we going to 4%? Because that's a big difference. So it's a, it's a very good question. I'll start with inflation. So obviously inflation peaked in June of last year around 9% if we're looking at the CPI data. And it's declined pretty dramatically uh, since then to around 3%. And we saw, I think, 12 uh, consecutive declines in the year-over-year -year data, which is a very rapid decline. So what was declining or what was driving that decline in inflation? And the answer is it was mostly durable goods and non-durable goods. It was mostly not services. We saw the big shift in spending from goods into services. The, the question now is, what's driving services inflation? So, so now durable goods inflation is kind of stabilized. Maybe it's declining a little bit, but we don't expect it to be a big driver of disinflation anymore from here. You know, perhaps when the labor market breaks, it will be, but until then, probably not. We've seen we've seen most of the major disinflation from goods and durable goods. The question is what's going to happen with services. So we have to think about what's driving services inflation. And it's really wage growth, right? If you look at uh, the Atlanta Fed's wage growth tracker and you compare it to service CPI services inflation X energy, so really the wage sensitive driver of inflation, the correlation is almost 90% going back 20 years. So as long as wage growth is comping in the four to 5% range, depending on what you look at, right? The employment cost index, the wage tracker, average hourly earnings, they're, they're kind of all in that range of four to 5%. We would expect uh, services inflation to sort of tend toward that range as well. So uh, we've been committed disinflationists since June of last year, really before June of last year. Uh, we, were, we were early to that call, but we've been saying that we, we don't wanna you know, raise the flag of victory yet um, because services inflation and the drivers of services inflation are still running pretty hot, uh, particularly the drivers of services inflation, wage growth, income growth, et cetera. Uh, and on top of that, we've seen a 13% price increase in the price of oil month over month. Oil tends to lead CPI inflation by about three months with a 75% correlation. So that indicates that we're probably going to see a little bit of an increase in one energy inflation, but probably goods inflation as well, uh, heading into September, October, November. And, um, Again, that's against the backdrop of services that are continuing to run pretty hot. Um, so we do think that perhaps over a 12-month basis, inflation is going to come down because recessions are always disinflationary events. But next two or three months, you know, I think we're very likely to see inflation hooking back up toward 4%. And the question is, are investors ready for that? Are policymakers ready for that? I don't think that's clear. I think that'll probably be um, the catalyst for policy surprise. It's why we think that at least one more interest rate is highly likely uh, in 2023, and perhaps we could see two. I think right now the odds of two hikes is penciled in at uh, about four or five percent, not penciled in, but priced in by the, the federal uh, Fed funds futures market. I think it's probably higher than five percent. You know, it's not to say it's over 50 percent, but but maybe it's 10 or 15 percent um, or 20 percent. So uh, on your question about interest rates, where do rates go through if we see a seven percent unemployment rate? Boy, that's a good question. I don't know if it's a call that I'm prepared to make quite yet. I think maybe I could reframe it in easier terms. Will rates go back down to zero again? Like, will we see zero interest rate policy again? Probably not, unless there's some sort of systemic shock, which I don't. I don't think I can predict uh, at this point in the cycle. I think, you know, maybe we see, you know, two, two you know, two percent Fed funds rate uh, through the the, uh, the trough of this recession, but. I'm inclined to think that 0% interest rate policy, again, is, is unlikely. Got it. So my one of my final questions for you is, is a rallying stock market uh, something that is going to make the labor market stronger for longer? You're higher for longer, stronger for longer. I just made, I just made that up. The labor market stronger for longer because of the S&P 500. Uh, when stock markets are high, Corporate executives are not under pressure to uh, increase profitability by laying people off. You know, we saw that, for example, Facebook and some large tech tech companies, their stocks were under pressure last year, and then they did some layoffs. Um, now the stocks are are rallying like crazy, and uh, you know, you're not hearing so much about about layoffs. I'm, I got to give credit to Julian Brigden, who's made this point of like we lived in a uh, financialized economy, so when the stock market rallies, that means that. Uh, you know, people will, will hold on to workers. And that means for the Federal Reserve, if, if they want to fight you know, labor-driven inflation, a high stock market, a rallying stock market, is an impediment to their mandate to restrict in inflation. And um, 
yeah, so so the, so they ha- they have to keep on hiking. The higher stock market goes, the the higher interest rates have to go. Um, that worked. That th- thinking worked very well last year. Um, this year, you know, not so much um, in terms of what's being priced into the future. But yeah, I mean, do you think that a S and P five hundred at 4,500, 4,500 is just one that is you know companies are going to be much less inclined to shed workers than if the stock market was at three thousand? So I think the short answer is. Yes, on the margins. Uh, and if you look at how change rate of change in household household net worth and compare it to consumption, it's you know a positive leading correlation. But that said, it's not a primary driver. I think the primary driver that you want to look at is probably corporate profit and corporate margins. And when we look at the corporate sector at Invictus, what we see is margins that are about 300 to 310 basis points off of their peak uh, in aggregate which is consistent with historical recessions. That's generally the amount of margin contraction you'd need to see to induce layoffs. That said, we're coming off of a very, very high peak, right? Margins were very, very high. I mean, they've been improving since the 80s, but they were at a secular peak, you know, sort of through 2021. So maybe we see, need to see a little bit more than 300 basis points of, of margin contraction. But in any case, it's happening. And, you know, executives are obviously paying attention to this. Uh, corporate profits are about 12% off of their cycle peak. Again, that's consistent with the beginning of historical recessions. It's consistent with the beginning of periods where corporations are beginning to uh, lay off more workers. So I would say probably I would track the fundamentals first and the stock price afterward. And you know, more specifically, I would really be looking at manufacturing payrolls because again, that's the canary in the coal mine of the labor market, right? And you're almost always going to see layoffs in those important cyclical leading industries before you see them anywhere else. So you know, at, when you're seeing layoffs in manufacturing, residential construction, trucking, temp payrolls, et cetera, that's re- when you should really be uh, looking for broader weakness in the labor market in the coming, you know, three to six months. How much do you think earnings will decline? They've declined, I believe, three quarters in a row on a year over year basis. Uh, but the part of the reason the stock markets rallied so much, we, we discussed, is analysts are forecasting that, you know, Q3, Q4, and then 2024 is going to be, you know, gangbusters again. Profitability will go up because of AI. Who knows? But uh, what, yeah, what do you think in terms of profitability for the, in terms of earnings for the S&P 500? So just in terms of setting expectations by, by looking at history, historically, most recessions result in a 25 to 30% drawdown in corporate profits from peak. Right now, we're about 12% uh, off, of, off of the peak. So another 20 points from here wouldn't be unreasonable. If it's a really if it's a severe recession, which we think it could be, maybe we see a 35% drawdown from peak. In any case, it's it's hard to imagine that stocks perform super well through an environment like that, unless the Fed is pulling out the bazooka in terms of stimulus, which we don't think that they'll do, right? I think that the Fed is likely to be slow to stimulate again the cycle and through this recession if we get one. And uh, I think the perhaps the obvious reason is that they just got burned with inflation from stimulating too hard last time. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll pay attention and be data dependent, but our base case is, is, you know, we're going to see a rather dramatic decline in corporate profits and the Fed will be slower to help than it has been in the past. Well, Mike, my final question for you is if in December or January, the unemployment rate is still at 3.5%, consumer spending is, is still very high. What are the reasons you think uh, that the thesis hasn't played out? And do you think, oh, uh, the thesis, it's just going to play out maybe in you know June of mid-2024, or you know what, what would cause you to fundamentally change your thesis that actually this is not the end of a business cycle, this is you know beginning of a new one? So fundamentally, it would have to be interest rates, right? I think interest rates will have to come down in order for there to be a real growth recovery of any kind. And the data that matters, the you know, the production data, uh, you know, the housing data. But uh I think that's very unlikely, especially when you see wage growth comping at four or five percent. I just don't think that there's any way the Fed can cut interest rates from here. You know, to see a new business cycle, I think it would have you'd have to see a change in in interest rates. But we could be proven wrong in terms of timing by factors other than interest rates. So, for example, I don't think it's impossible that manufacturing companies are slow to fire people at the same rate that they have through historical slowdowns. And uh, you could just think about that logistically, right? There was a big round of layoffs through COVID. Um, then the Fed stimulated really aggressively, which is essentially the Fed's way of telling manufacturing companies, hey, you need to start hiring again. You're going to see a big boom in housing and subsequently goods. 
And then the Fed tightened really aggressively. Now they're saying you need to fire everyone again. So, you know, there are logistical constraints in terms of hiring and firing and, you know, hiring and firing again. And there's also reputational constraints, right? That's a bad look if you are continuing to fire and hire people in rapid succession like that. So, you know, it's possible that manufacturing companies are saying like, look, I'm just going to wait it out. Maybe we'll, you know, conduct a few rounds of layoffs here and there, but we're not going to let go of 25 or 30% of our workforce the way that we might, might have 20 years ago, because, you know, uh, it just doesn't make many sense in the long term. reputational damage to our business just doesn't warrant that. So, you know, and I could go through, through maybe some other hypotheticals, but there are plenty, plenty of ways in which the business cycle could be extended. I don't think that the business cycle can completely start over without a change in Fed policy. Yeah, one thing we haven't talked about, uh, which really supports your thesis and which I agree with you on, is just bank leases and bank loans have been stagnant since January. And uh, you know, typically for an economic expansion to continue, you need bank credit growth to continue. Uh, I guess one argument that the yeah, expansion could continue without credit growth is just the government spending so much money. Yeah, what, do you, what do you make of that argument of fiscal deficits are so large, the CHIPS Act, the Inflation Reduction Act stimulus, tax credits, um, tax brackets being adjusted higher because of inflation, uh, cost of living adjustments for Social Security. So, you know, inflation, begetting inflation, which causes inflationary adjustments, which causes more inflation, just like the the U.S. got. Yeah, yes, normally in a business cycle, all these things would tend to, to a recession, but the government is spending so much money that it is a, uh, uh, you know, the, the economy is still going to run hot. It's a good question. Uh, it's a little bit of a wild card. It's a little bit challenging to predict. So maybe I'll think about it over three three different time horizons, and I'll, I'll go over it quickly. So first, uh, when the Treasury has to issue new securities, that's a headwind for financial conditions, right? You generally see rates go up as more securities are introduced to the markets. That's generally bad for stock prices, bad for bond prices, especially in the quantities that we're talking about in the back half of 2023, right? When you're talking about $500 billion, a billion dollars, or excuse me, a trillion dollars, $2 trillion, right? These are you know enormous volumes of issuance. When the Fed is reducing its balance sheet, yeah, for sure. Right, right, and that's double double trouble, so to speak. Second, it's stimulative, right, because people start to spend that money. You know, it gooses consumption. It it's a it's a it's a tailwind for whatever industries are you know the recipients of that those funds. The third longer term impact, the really long term impact, is slower long term real economic growth um, because the government crowds out productive investment, and generally governments. Federal governments in particular, central governments, are not very good allocators of capital. And so you see resources poured into things that are not accretive to real GDP growth. You also listen, you'll hear dialogue to the effect of, well, maybe GDP growth is not the best long-term measure of economic well-being. Maybe not. Uh, but you probably need to see something like real positive GDP growth to see long real-term earnings growth for corporations and strong performance from stocks. So over the long term, it, it really matters quite a bit. And, uh, you know, as deficit spending gets larger, as the federal debt continues to increase as a percent of GDP, um, that'll be a headwind to long term growth. It has been for the last 40 years. And, uh, you know, I see no reason for that relationship to change unless Warren Buffett starts uh, allocating capital for the U.S. instead of Berkshire. Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting. I feel like the first two points, I definitely agree with you on those latter two points. It's you know, getting into the political realm, but it's really open for interpretation. I mean, going forward is giving subsidies to companies who have factories in other countries to bring them factories back. Is that better for growth than like stocks buying back their own shares? Maybe, you know, maybe, maybe it is. I don't, I don't know. Um, and again, it maybe just cause it wasn't in the past doesn't mean it's in the future, but uh, Mike, you've, you've been great uh, uh, sport. Thanks for, for sharing your, your views here. Um, how can people find out more about you and Victus research? So uh, you can check us out at Invictus research.com. Uh, we produce a, a variety of, of research products. The flagship product is probably the Daily Edge. It goes over all the most important economic data releases from the day prior, puts them into the context of the business cycle, provides them back testing and whatnot. And all of our research is delivered over video. So it's not just another boring PDF in your inbox. It's five or 10 minutes, all the data uh, real quick, hopefully some appealing, intuitive graphics that make everything easy to understand. And, uh, and that's what we do. And you can also find us at uh, Invictus Macro on Twitter. There we go. And yeah, hope uh, you could send us some of those charts. We could put them on screen so people uh, could know what, what kind of work you do. Uh, thanks again, Mike. And thanks everyone for watching. Yeah, thank you for having me, Jack. Forward Guidance, the program you just enjoyed, hopefully, can be viewed on YouTube at BlockWorks Macro 
or heard as a podcast on Apple Podcast and Spotify. Episodes are typically released on Apple and Spotify a few hours before they air on YouTube. Please leave a review on Apple Podcast if you feel so inclined. Also, you can get 10% off to Permissionless 2023 and BlockWorks Research using code GUIDANCE10. Thanks again and be well.